So now we will learn about exclusive economic zones or EEZ. Now, what is an exclusive economic zone? Now, we studied the introduction part of it, I think, in our second lecture, second class. I remember that where we learned about certain um, you know, important zones like the territorial sea, the contiguous zone, and we also studied about exclusive economic zone. And we said that uh, it is after the 24 nautical miles and up to 200 nautical miles within in, in that range, it, uh, you know, you call that area as exclusive economic zone that is beyond the territorial sea, 12 nautical miles up to the 200 nautical miles is exclusive economic zone. Now, what is an exclusive economic zone or EEZ? Now, it is an area of the ocean beyond the 200 nautical miles of a nation's territorial sea. That is, sorry, 12 nautical miles and encompasses uh, 200 nautical miles. So the coastal nation has jurisdiction over both living and non-living resources of the EEZ. Now, I'm repeating this. Exclusive economic zone is a zone which is beyond the 12 nautical miles of the territorial sea. So there is a small correction there on the screen where it says beyond 200 nautical miles. But in fact, it is beyond the 12 nautical miles of the territorial sea. And from the 12 nautical miles of the territorial sea, it is around 200 nautical miles. OK, so 200 nautical miles after the territorial sea is the exclusive economic zone. So the coastal nation has jurisdiction over both living and non-living resources of the EEZ. So Article 57 of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea specifies the breadth of the exclusive economic zone, where it states that the exclusive economic zone shall not extend beyond the 200 nautical miles from the baselines from which the breadth of the territorial sea is measured. As you can see here in the diagram here, so it says that this portion of the 12 nautical miles up to 200 nautical miles, that is maximum 200 nautical miles and not beyond 200 nautical miles is considered as the EEZ or exclusive economic zone. Now, part five of the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea, 1982, deals with exclusive economic zone under articles 55 to 75. Now, article 55 provides for a specific legal regime for exclusive economic zones. It states that um, the exclusive economic zone is an area beyond and adjacent to the territorial sea, subject to the specific legal re regime established in this part, under which the rights and jurisdiction of the coastal state and the rights and freedom of other states are governed by relevant provisions of this convention. Now, Article 56 enumerates the rights, jurisdiction, and duties of a coastal state in the exclusive economic zone. Uh, it states that, just mute your mic, please. Okay, it states that in the exclusive economic zone, the coastal state has sovereign rights for the purpose of exploring and exploiting, conserving and managing the natural resources, whether living or non-living, that is all your, you know, fishes and all that of the water superjacent to the seabed and of the seabed and its subsoil and with regard to other activities for the economic exploitation and exploration of the zone, such as the production of energy from the water currents and winds. Now, the coastal state also has jurisdiction as provided for in the relevant provisions of this convention with regards to the establishment and use of artificial islands or installations and structures, marine scientific research, protection and preservation of marine environment, and other rights and duties that are provided for in this convention. That means what are the rights of the state, of the coastal state? They have the right to fish, they have the right to exploit the resources, that is to fish, conserve, manage natural resources, whether living or non-living which are super adjacent to the seabed 
and of the seabed and its subsoil and so on. And it has jurisdiction as provided under this convention that is UNCLOS and uh, also with respect to jurisdiction, with respect to what? So the establishment and use of any artificial islands, installations and structures, marine scientific research, and uh, the protection and preservation of the marine environment or other rights and duties provided for in this convention. Now, in exercise of its rights and performing its duties under this convention in the exclusive economic zone, the coastal state shall have due regard to the rights and duties of other states and shall act in a manner compatible with the provisions of this convention. That means while they are performing their duties or while they're exercising their rights, any coastal state for that matter, while they're exercising their rights over the exclusive economic zone, say, for example, they are fishing or they're conducting some scientific study. So while they are exercising their rights or they're performing any of its duties, the, you know, the coastal st states must see that they do not, uh, you know, harm or disregard the rights and duties of any other states or any other coastal state and they have to act in a manner that is compatible with the provisions of this convention that means they have to abide by the provisions of this convention so the rights set out in this article with respect to the seabed and subsoil shall be exercised in accordance with part six and part six deals with provisions relating to continental shelf Article 57 specifies the breadth of the economic, exclusive economic zone. So it says that, of course, the definition, it talks about the definition, it talks about the breadth of EZ, and it says it shall not extend beyond 200 nautical miles from the baseline from which the breadth of the territorial sea is measured. That means it should not go beyond 200 nautical miles. Now, Article 58 enumerates the rights and duties of other states in the exclusive economic zone. That is, in the exclusive economic zone, all states, whether local, whether uh, coastal or landlocked, I'm sorry, whether coastal or landlocked, enjoy subject to the relevant provisions of this convention and the freedoms referred to in Article. One minute. I try to always, um, you know. Mute your mic as well as um, close videos. Anyway, so in exclusive economic zone, all states, whether coastal or landlocked, enjoy, subject to the relevant provisions of this convention, the freedoms referred to in Article 87 of navigation and overflight and of the laying of submarine cables and pipelines and other international lawful uses of the sea related to these freedoms, such as those associated with the operation of ships aircraft and submarine cables and pipelines and compatible with other provisions of this convention. Then Article 88 115, which generally deals with the high seas and other pertinent rule of international law also apply to the EEZ insofar as they may be incompatible with this part. So wherever possible, Article 88 to 115 is applicable when, you know, and 88 115 specifically talks about high seas. So wherever applicable, it, uh, you know, wherever possible, wherever, wherever it is applicable, one could also use those provision as being applicable to the EEZ. Now, in exercising their rights and performing their duties under this convention in the EEZ, states shall have due regard to the rights and duties of the other coastal states and shall comply with the laws and regulations adopted by that particular state. And further, Article 9, 59 deals with the basis for the resolution of conflicts. What if there are conflicts or how it is resolved? They say that as per this convention, it does not attribute rights or jurisdiction to a coastal state or to other states within the EEZ. And if a conflict arises between the interests of a coastal state and any other state, then the conflict should be resolved on the basis of the principles of equity. So how do they resolve conflicts? They use the principles of equity and in the light of all the relevant circumstances, taking into account, you know, the respective importance of the interests involved to the parties as well as to the international community as a whole. So Article 60 further provides for the provisions governing artificial islands. So what about artificial islands, which are, you know, or apart from artificial islands, the installations and structures in the EEZ. So in case of that, the coastal state should have 
exclusive right over the artificial islands, whether to construct or authorize or regulate the construction and so on, including the installation, structures, fixtures, and so on. So the coastal state shall have you know, exclusive jurisdiction over artificial islands, even if, if it is with respect to customs, fiscal, health, or, or safety and immigration laws and regulations. Due notice must be given of the construction of such artificial islands, installation or structures and permanent means by giving warning of their presence must be maintained. And the coastal state may wherever necessary establish reasonable safety zones around such artificial islands, installations and structures and thereby take a appropriate measures to ensure the safety both of navigation and of artificial uh, islands, installations, and structures. Now, what about the breadth of the safety zones? How is the breadth of the safety zones determined? So the breadth of the safety zones is determined by the coastal state when they take into account applicable uh, you know, international standards. There are certain applicable standards, like for example, say now, um, artificial islands, their installations and structures should not exceed a distance of 500 meters around them. Okay, so they have to comply with the applicable international standards when it comes to safety zones around these artificial islands. All ships, on the other hand, must respect these safety zones and should comply with generally accepted international standards. Next is Article 61. It deals with the conservation or protection of the living resources in the EEZ. For example, all these fishes and other, you know, marine living uh, creatures which are there in the EEZ. So it is the duty of the coastal state, you know, who should protect or conserve the living resources in the EEZ. It shall first determine the allowable catch of the living resources in its economic zone, that is, to the extent of which, you know, um, you know, they can, you know, exploit the resources or use the resources and they should ensure that proper conservation and management measures are adopted for the protection as well as conservation of living resources in the EEZ. Further, the, oh, this is a, uh, now, further, in taking such measures, the coastal state shall also take into consideration the effects on species associated with or dependent upon harvested, spe harvested species. That means we also should consider uh, in the pursuit of conservation, uh, they should also consider the extent to which such resources are exploited or to the extent of which such resources, living resources are harvested. For example, the extent of which fishing is done. So apart from that, available scientific information of, or fishing effort statistics should also be taken into consideration. Article 62 deals with utilization or using of those living resources. So the key principle here is, I wanted to remember, the key principle is optimum utilization of living resources. So optimum utilization of living resources is encouraged in the EEZs. And it is the coastal states that are, you know, that have the capacity to determine uh, or they, they are, you know, having the sovereignty to determine the capacity to harvest the living resources in a particular EEZ. Further, in case they want to give access to a particular EEZ to other states, to its economic exclusive economic zone under this article, then the coastal state shall take into account all relevant factors, including inter alia, the significance of the living resources of that area to the economy of the coastal state concerned and other national interests and so on. The nationals of other states fishing in the EEZ should comply with the conservation measures protection measures and other terms and conditions established in the laws and regulations of the coastal state. That means it, whatever laws and regulations are devised or whatever laws and regulations are promulgated should be consistent with this convention that is UNCLOS, United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, 1982, and we relate inter alia to some of the things that is to the following. One is licensing of fishermen, licensing of fishing vessels, licensing of fishing equipment, including some payment of fees and other forms of remuneration. Apart from that, determining the species which may be caught or fixing quotas of the catch. Like they will say, okay, you cannot fish more than you know a particular limit. 
So they fix quotas of the catch and so on. And also about, they regulate seasons and areas of fishing, the types, the size, and the amount of gear, and the type, size, and amount of fishing vessels that may be used. Uh, they may have certain protocols to be followed, fixing the age and size of the fish and other species that may be, uh, may be caught and so on. Apart from that, they might specify information required of fishing vessels, you know, in the effort of, you know, maintaining statistics and vessel position reports. They might also require, under the authorization and control of the coastal state, you know, the conduct of specified fisheries research programs, how they are conducted, and the extent of, uh, you know, the scientific research that is conducted. They might place observers or trainees on board of such vessels by the coastal state, or, you know, terms and conditions relating to joint venture or any cooperative arrangements or requirements for training of personnel and transfer of fisheries technology, including enhancement of coastal state or any other enforcement procedures. These coastal states are expected to give due notice of conservation and management of laws and other regulations. Article 63 of United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea also deals with conservation of stocks occurring within the economic zones. And Article 64 deals with conservation of high migratory species. While the Article 65 deals with conservation and limiting the abuse and exploitation of marine mammals towards which end the states shall cooperate along with international as well as intergovernmental organization. Further, Article 66 deals with conservation of anadromous stocks. Now, what are these anadromous stocks? Now, anadromous stocks means those species, you know, which migrate, say, for example, fishes that migrate from the sea to the rivers to breed or multiply or spawn in fresh, fresh waters. So what they do is from the seas, they travel to fresh waters for the purpose of breeding or spawning or multiplying. So such fishes, example, or such stocks of living, uh, uh, is, is living uh, uh, you know, resources, so they are considered as anadromous stocks. For example, salmon fish. You see, salmon fish, normally, it is considered or categorized as an anadromous stock because it migrates from the sea to the river to breed or spawn, and it, it, it migrates to fresh waters or even rivers. So Article 67 deals with catadromous species, which is ex the exact opposite of anadromous stocks. Catadromous stocks are those species whose fishing is permitted only in inland waters, and they are those species that spend their life cycle in rivers and fresh waters, but they prefer to breed or spawn in the sea, just exactly opposite of anadromous species. Now, example of catadromous species is eel. Are you understanding me? So again, I'm repeating, anadromous species are those, they move, they actually, their life cycle is spent in the sea. But they prefer, for the purpose of breeding or spawning, they prefer to go or travel to the fresh waters or rivers. But catadromous, on the contrary, their, their life cycle is, they are normally river fish or a river species. And, but they, for the purpose of spawning or breeding, they travel to the seas. They prefer, you know, uh, you know uh, seas. For example, eel. So 66 deals with Anadromous stocks and 67 deals with catadromous stock. Now, 69 specifies the right of landlocked states. So, landlocked states. A landlocked state shall have the right to participate, of course, on an equitable basis in the exploitation of an appropriate part of surplus of living resources. And Article 70 talks about the right of geographically disadvantaged states. What about geographically disadvantaged states. What are those states? Geographically disadvantaged states are those states which, uh, you know, it could be in coastal states, including states uh, bordering enclosed or semi-enclosed seas, whose geographical situation makes them dependent upon the exploitation of living resources of the EEZ, of, of other states in the sub-region or region for adequate supplies of fish for the nutritional purpose of their population or parts thereof. So they are dependent. So they are considered as geographically disadvantaged states where they don't have fishing as their primary activity within their states, but they depend upon other coastal states. So geographical disadvantaged states shall have the right to participate 
equally in the exploitation of the appropriate part of surplus of, uh, of living resources in these EEZ, zone, EEZ or e exclusive economic zones. Of course, in conformity with the provisions of this particular article, as well as Article 61 and 62 of this convention. Article 71 talks about non-applicability of 69 and 70 in case of coastal state whose economy is overwhelmingly de dependent on exploitation of living resources. And Article 72 lays down the restriction on the transfer of rights. Now, what do we mean by transfer of rights? They say that rights over the EEZ for exploitation of the resources or use of these resources or utilization of the resources are not easily transferable. That is, rights provided under Article 69 and 70 to exploit living resources it cannot be directly or indirectly transferred to third states or their nationals by lease or license, by establishing joint ventures and so on. That's not possible. Now, however, it does not preclude the states concerned from obtaining technical or financial assistance from third states or international organizations in order to facilitate the exercise of rights pursuant to Article 69 and 70, provided that it does not have the effect as described in paragraph one. Further, Article 73 talks about enforcement of laws and regulations of the coastal state. Now, what happens in case a vessel is arrested? In case a vessel is arrested, along with the crew, that means they should be promptly released upon the posting of reasonable bond or other security. So the vessels are expected to, you know, provide a reasonable bond or a security and that would secure their release. Now, coastal state penalties for violation of fisheries laws and regulation in the EEZ may not include imprisonment in the absence of agreement to the contrary by the states. However, if there is an agreement to that effect, Imprisonment, of course, can take place, but in case there is no agreement to that effect, okay, that is in the absence of agreement to the contrary by the state concerned or any other form, so there can be no imprisonment, but some other form of corporal punishment may be inflicted. In case of arrest or detention of foreign vessels, the coastal state of caution promptly notify the flag state, that is the country to which the vessel belongs and in a, the flag of which it carries, through appropriate channels, through proper channels, and accordingly action will be taken and any penalties would be imposed in case necessary or in case there is contravention of any particular provision, of course, penalties would be imposed. Now, Article 74 deals with delimitation of EEZ between states with opposite or adjacent coasts. So what about opposite or adjacent coasts? So that, of course, will be affected by an agreement on the basis of international law as referred to Article 38 of the statute of ICJ, that is International Court of Justice. How, however, in case there is no agreement that can be reached within a reasonable period of time, then the states concerned shall resort to provision that are provided for in part 15 of this particular convention. Now, in case there is an agreement enforced between two states, okay, on questions relating to delimitation of the EEZ, now, it shall be determined, of course, in accordance to the provisions of that particular agreement. Now, Article 75 is an interesting article. Now, it talks about charts and lists of geographical coordinates. Now, subject to this part, of course, the outer limit lines of the EEZ and the lines of delimitation, which are drawn in accordance with Article 74, shall be shown on charts of a scale or scales adequate for ascertaining their position. So where appropriate list of geographical coordinates of points specifying the geodetic uh, datum may be substituted for such outer limit lines or lines of delimitation. Now, the coastal state actually should give due publicity to such charts or lists of geographical coordinates. And of course, they are expected to deposit a copy of such a chart or a list with the Secretary General of the United Nations. So this is all about the EEZ. EEZ normally can come as um, essay type of question or it can come as a long note or a short note. It, it, it depends. However, you'll have to give the definition of EEZ and mention about all these articles from Article 55 to 75 of Part 5 of the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea. Okay, so someone has a question.
one minute. Yes, beyond 200 nautical miles, does any country in the world have the right to exploit the resources in it or is it prohibited? So beyond 200 nautical miles, that means we are talking about the high seas. Uh, now, again, it depends depending upon, um, you know, they are not, there is no direct, what is the disadvantage state? Okay. We'll go to that, Ruvida. Just let me just answer this question. So what is beyond 200 nautical miles? So let me ask you a question. What is beyond 200 nautical miles? Do you remember what we learned in the chapter of the high seas? Can anyone answer this question? Is The question basically he's trying to ask is, is fishing permitted in the high seas? Right? So can anyone answer this? If you remember what we learned? I said during the last class, when I was teaching about the high seas, I said that for the high seas, fishing may be permitted, but of course they need certain, uh, you know, permissions. So certain permits have to be taken from the relevant authority. So on, only on the basis of permits, you know, they act on the basis of permits. So on the basis of those permits, of course, they can exploit those resources. If you go back to the last chapter, what we discussed, uh, during the last class, this answer will be addressed. Next is, what is the disadvantaged state? So let me repeat that for you. One minute. What? Now, article 70, sub-article 2. For the purpose of this part, geographically disadvantaged state means coastal states, including states, bordering enclosed or semi-enclosed seas whose geographical situation makes them dependent upon the exploitation of the resources of the EEZ of other states in the sub-region or region for adequate supplies of fish for the nutritional purposes of their population or parts thereof and coastal states which can claim no exclusive economic zone of their own. Now, who are the disadvantaged states when it comes to, um, you know, uh, living resources or tapping of resources? So what are geographically disadvantaged states? Can you tell me now? You can say that it, they are states in the framework of what? In the framework that does not come within the EEZ and they do not have EEZ of their own. They have no, uh, you know, means of exploitation of living resources, for example, fishes, and they rely on the other coastal states for certain living resources or for tapping living resources, such as fishing and so on. So they rely uh, on fishing for the nutritional purposes of their own population. They do not have their own coastal area. They do not have, um, you know, EEZ. So they depend on some other coastal states. Under whose sovereignty comes the EEZ or under whose jurisdiction or who are allowed or who have easy access to these EEZs? Is it clear? Yes, it is clear. Okay. So Thank any, you. You're welcome. So any other question? Okay. So, uh, so that's about it. And um, now we will, dis in case we get disconnected, please join back. We will discuss a little bit about our final exams. And I'm just going to tell you about the question paper pattern. Just in case we get disconnected, please join back. <laughs> 